It's Tuesday. It's 7.04. Or, I don't know, something like it. Something around 7.04. Sorry I'm late, y'all, but I'm going to let you know why I'm late. And I do apologize, but it's for a very, very good reason. So, as you guys know, before I do this, I always go live with my husband and typically another guest on his podcast, TOLpodcast.com. And tonight's topic was... It was heavy, and I needed to debrief, right? (laughs) So tonight's topic on my husband's podcast, we were talking about Bill Cosby. We were talking about the the verdict. Of course, he was convicted um, on three counts. And, you know, everybody's just kind of, I don't know, processing it right now. And we couldn't help but have that conversation here in our home. So we took that to the podcast, had a conversation with my husband and another one of his friends, and my husband's actually here. Um, babe, you want to hop on? Like, for real? Are you serious that you want to be in this video real quick? Real quick? You know what? I'm going to bring my husband on super quick so we can talk about the podcast. <laughs> I'm putting him on the spot. I'm putting him on the spot right now. So we... Oh, there he is. <laughs> hey, babe. Hey, bye. Um, so for anyone who's new, the person that I just added to um, the stream here is my husband. Uh, he goes by, what, what do you want to be? Jay Lip? Uh, just just, just, lip, just lip. Jay okay. Lip. I Jay Lip thinking out loud. You know what it is, <laughs> baby. You know what it is. So I just wanted to bring you on like super quick. Um, I, was, I was telling the folks that, you know, we had a really heavy topic this time around. And we're still oh, going to yeah. get to my stuff, but I thought it was um, kind of a good opportunity for me to kind of share what was going on in the podcast. So do you want to kind of let them know what was going on tonight? Uh, yeah, sure. So basically, uh, TLYarncrafts.com is pretty much the shit, and that's all I got to say. Um, beyond that, keep uh, watching and learning how to crochet as I learned to crochet myself. Uh, I used to call it crochet, and now it's crochet. Um, <laughs> and learning patterns is very difficult, so Tony will help you to do that at TLYarncrafts.com. Um, you got to learn how to do the double hop skip stitch. Um, that's one of the <laughs> hooks that I used to use when I was crocheting when I was a young man. And um, yeah, so that's what it is. I love you. Perfect. Well, thanks, babe. Thanks for, for checking in. Everyone, oh, yeah, no if you want to check it out, um, we just talked about Bill Cosby and we also talked about the Kanye West interview on the podcast. So check out TOLpodcast.com to get access to that. All the links will be up shortly. Um, thanks for hanging out, babe. I'll see you later. Love you. All right. Love you go. Bye. Okay, just me again. All right. (laughs) So thanks for letting me take that little detour really quick. Um, But as you guys come in, of course, let me know who you are, where you're checking in from, and what you're working on this evening. Um, As far as what I'm working on, I'm working on still being super duper excited about the flat iron shawl back here. Like, I had no idea when I released that pattern that it was going to get the traction that it did. You know, as a designer, you always hope so. You always hope that people will be inspired by your project. Um... But I wanted to just take a second to give my my heartfelt thanks to everyone who is not only making the flat iron shawl, but is just experiencing it and kind of going on a journey with it. Hey, mom. Um, what I realized is, you know, making the shawl is not even the biggest deal. I think um, an almost bigger deal is just thinking about what that project means to you, picking out the perfect yarn and and really taking your time being thoughtful about it, which I think is amazing. Um, So we've got someone checking in from Florida. Hello, Mosaic Crochet Project. Tell me about that. Mosaic Crochet, Sharon from Columbus, Columbus, Ohio. That's where I am. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Um, Sorry, I need to lift up my chair. Couldn't see y'all. Yes. Hey, checking in from Martin, Tennessee. Hey, Bridget. I'm checking in from Martin, Tennessee. I'm finishing up my sunflower hexagon blanket tonight. It's been a long time coming. That's amazing. I have so many forever projects, like things that I was really, really gung-ho about like two years ago, and now it's... (sighs) Checking in from the kitchen. You're hilarious, Nicole. Hey. Hello from Columbus as well. Are you serious? All these Columbus people? Have I met y'all? Because I don't think so. Maybe we need to do like a meetup at Yarn and Dash or something. We need to make this happen. I didn't realize there were so many people in Columbus. Um, Hello from Maine. Hello. So I want to jump into tonight's topic because it's like super meaty. I kind of broke it down into two parts. But hello, Cleveland. Um, So we are in a new month. We're in the month of May. In the entire month of May, we're going to be talking about markets. 
Okay, we're going to be talking about craft craft shows. We're going to be talking about markets, the kind of the before, the during, the after, um, how to prepare, how to make sure you're signing up for the right markets, how to even find the right markets. We're going to be going down that entire rabbit hole, working on baby blankets before the baby gets here. Congratulations. It's so exciting. Um, hey, from Pittsburgh. Wow, you guys are not far at all, um, which I love. Oh, she called me Sean Sherm. My mom called me Sean Sherm. Um, so I definitely wanted to take some time to talk about markets because I know that, you know, with the spring summer season upon us, there are some of us who are doing markets now. There are some of us who are already gearing up for markets for fall and you guys thinking that far ahead i'm like um so regina sk is that saskatchewan in canada oh that's the canadian flag so maybe it is what up alex checking in from the bx i love it um <laughs> that was hella corny i'll never do that again i promise um so yeah we want to talk about markets because Markets mean a lot of things to different people. We're all on different journeys, whether you're interested in markets, signing up for your first one, signing up for your 50th one. I think there's plenty that we can all learn, and I definitely want to hear from all of you as well. I have been doing markets for, it's 2018, so well, like four years now. God, the time flies. It's insane. Um, so I've been doing markets for four years, and I have seen it all. My very first market to just kind of give you guys a perception that we do not start out on top. <laughs> My very first market was, um, I think I paid $10 to get into it. It was literally in a church basement and it was half craft show, half like garage sale. It was so bad. And not only was it a not great show, but I also was not prepared. I did my absolute best that I knew at the time. Um, oh, Sharon from Columbus by Mount Carmel East. Really? That is not far from me at all. That's crazy. Um, so, you know, my, my setup was all on flat tables. I think I had two really creepy mannequin heads and I was selling everything from crochet jewelry to baby blankets to hats and scarves in weird colors. There was no cohesion. I was just all over the place. So just understand that it does take time to get good at these things. But I think the more you know and the more prepared you are, the less kind of bumps you need to hit in the road. So I hope that my experience um, helps you a little bit, especially if you're early on. And even if you're not, you know, hopefully I drop a gem or two that you can kind of tuck into your toolkit. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Just understand that I'm going to leave time at the end if you guys have questions and we can kind of jump around. Um, you can have them related to tonight's topic or anything else that has to do with markets. So the very first thing that I want to cover is nine questions to ask before you apply for a craft show. I think, um, I think if we start to look at craft shows as being like a give and get situation, then we can make sure that we're more prepared for the, the obligations that we put on ourselves um, as makers. So not only are you paying a booth fee to go sell your stuff, but I think also craft shows have to sell themselves to you. We have to be a little bit more selective about the shows that we end up in. And I think that's almost an idea that has just kind of rung true for me starting this year um, with my change in circumstance as far as running my business full time and kind of branching into other income streams. I have to be really choosy about the shows that I end up in. And there are shows that I've been in for the last four years that I'm choosing not to be in as of this year. And it was really hard to send that email to say, you know, thank you for the invitation, but I will not be returning this year. Um, so if you are perhaps applying to a brand new craft show that you've never done before, or even one that you've done before, and maybe you had some reservations and you're trying to do it, decide if you're going to do it again. Um, if you're not 100% sold on a show, I have nine questions that you should ask before um, you commit to an actual craft show. So the very first question, which will seem really obvious, but I promise you it's for, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure mom has some horror stories. Um, so the very first question, which will seem obvious, but believe me, I've, I've got some really important reasons why you should ask it is, when is it, right? So you want to know the date, you want to know the time, you want to know the date, particularly because depending on what season it is, or um, depending on kind of where it falls in your calendar, maybe if it's a weekday show or it's a weekend, if it's a Friday as opposed to a Saturday or a Sunday, all of that is going to make a difference when it comes to your sales, when it comes to traffic, when it comes to um, 
you know, even just the general vibe of the show. Because I've done shows, for example, maybe it's a three-day show, and on Friday night they have a preview, Saturday and Sunday is open to the public. I think that's fantastic if they have the traffic to bring people in. I think I just missed a question up here. I'm planning on doing a craft show slash benefit to raise money for a friend's son's college fund we are putting together for him since his mother died over the past summer. That is so sweet. That is like coming straight from your heart. And that is, I, I love hearing that. That's amazing. I love it. Yeah, you guys tell me what your, um, like where you are as far as craft shows. Are you in them? Have you done them before? Doing one for the first time? Totally not even interested in craft shows. I would love to know um, kind of what your experience with craft shows has been so far. So knowing the date and the time is super important. Um, a daytime show versus an evening show, one that starts at nine o'clock as opposed to noon. All of that makes a lot of difference. Um, and it really just depends on your market. If there's a craft show who can sell a Wednesday night, six to 10 events, that's awesome. If it's a show, like say for example, it's like a small private event at a boutique and it's just for a few hours and they're only inviting in you know certain customers that's great i think having the date and time gives you some context of what you can expect and you as an individual have to determine based on the context the date and the time of this event is this something that's going to be worth your time um and is it is it going to be something that's going to be fruitful for your business is it going to put you in front of the right people is it going to make you the money that you need because you should really be paying yourself for the amount of time that you put preparing for and actually running a show that time is money and you have to determine if that's a good fit for you um, the next question that you should ask before you commit to a craft show i think is where is it um, this is another one of those contextual type questions um, said i have done craft shows for the last few years the last for a few years, four years. Um, this fall, I won't be returning to two that I have done in the past. Instead, I'm doing two larger shows, which I'm nervous but excited about. See, those are the kind of decisions that I think are so important because you only have so much time available, which means, of course, you only have so much stock that you can take to a show. So you have to be choosy, right? If you're going to do two big shows as opposed to four small shows, that's going to make a huge difference. If that if doing those two big shows is going to make up for the other two smaller shows that you're not doing, then you're making a really great choice and saving yourself um, some of that energy and resources, for sure. That's awesome. Um, so where is it? So we're thinking in context of, you know, depending on the location, can the organizer still make a great show? So I've done shows in convention centers, churches, schools, at festivals, at museums. I've done shows everywhere. And... Sometimes it takes actually doing the show to really understand if that venue is a really good place. Um, you also have to consider is the show indoors or outdoors, right? Um, I'm assuming, and let me know if I'm incorrect. <laughs> um, I'm assuming most of us do crochet of some sort. I know there are maybe some jewelry people here too. Um, I know there are people that do soaps and other like beauty items. So you have to be really choosy of whether or not you can actually handle an outdoor show because that is some taxing stuff. Because if you do it when the weather is actually nice, you have to worry about heat because that'll melt soap real quick or that'll make it so people don't want to try on hats and scarves or don't even want to think about hat and scarf weather because it's finally warm outside like we all are right now. Uh, I tried streamlining my color palette, making an attractive setup, limiting my stock. It seems like people don't want to pay for handmade items. I understand where you're coming from, coming from, Rach Ale, but it's not true. People do want to buy handmade items. That's why, you know, that's why a lot of us still do this because we've, we've found a customer. Um, it could be just a, a collection of things that make it so people maybe at those markets don't want to buy that product. But I think that's why we're asking these questions now, right? So, um, and just one super quick tip, which I wasn't planning on covering today, but if you ever have a question about a craft show and whether or not it's really going to be worth your time, I would always encourage you to go to the show first. Go as a patron and take a look at the organizers and the volunteers. Take a look at the setup. Um, read the body language of the vendors. Read the body language of the customers. And, and that'll really help you decide if that's a good place for you. I feel like you can almost tell as soon as you get there. You know, if, if it's got a line out the door and the aisles are packed and everybody's having a great time and smiling, enjoying themselves and exchanging money, you know, maybe that's a really good place for you. Uh, if you go and it's a lot of like direct sales, like Scentsy and that stuff, I've never had good good I, I, that's never been good 
Um, I need to find the right fare. Yeah, and and I think, um, and I don't know if this is everyone everyone's experience, but I found that craft shows are popping up constantly, like so many brand new ones every single year. And you do have to be judicious about the shows that you decide to sign up for. Just because somebody reaches out to you and says, hey, I want you in my show, doesn't mean that you necessarily should be in that show. That just means they're really good at marketing and kind of drumming up the, the interest of vendors. Um, so they're opening up the invitation, but ultimately you have to make that decision and decide if that's a really good show for you. So that is, it is hard. Um, I have MS, he is our enemy, yeah. So even you as a person with your health have to decide if an outdoor show is a good idea because not only do you have to go set up outdoors, you have to have additional equipment like tents and weights. You're gonna be outside for six to eight to 10 hours and then you have to pack it all up and go back home. Girl, I'll tell you this much. I decided a long time ago, <laughs> outdoor short shows are not, <laughs> they are not for me. Like I, I tried every variation of it, but between my product and my temperament, yeah, not for me. <laughs> um, where do you find out about craft shows? So um, I am pretty plugged into the, the craft and art scene here in my local community, which I think is extremely important for you to find other crafters and other creative people. You can do that through um, like arts groups. So I know Creative Babes out here. Um, I know that there's like Rise in Design. There's a lot of like artsy people in that. Craft and Outlaws. You can even go to craft shows and introduce yourself to the vendors. And I think word of mouth is honestly the best way to find out about good craft shows. Go to a craft show that you would like to be in and talk to the vendors there. Ask them about other shows that they're gonna be in. A lot of them might even have a sheet of paper that tells you about other shows they're gonna be in. So if you find a vendor who's at a show that you like or that you'd like to be in, ask them where else they're going to be. I think that's a great way to do it. Um, I think there's also like good calendars and stuff that are available on Facebook that'll talk to you about other craft shows. So you can even go to the events page in Facebook and search craft shows in your local area. Um, also, I know if you're in the Columbus area, Craft and Outlaws put, if you're interested in, in the craft and outlaws circuit because they're very specific if you're interested in them they have suggestions for other shows within the region even like pittsburgh and cleveland and chicago and detroit and cincinnati that they have suggestions for other shows that you can go to um where do you find oh yeah i hope that answers that totally with you on the outdoors worrying about tents and weather and sandbags yeah it's just a whole nother thing now if your product is great out there like i know i buy a ton of jewelry at like festivals and craft shows that are outdoors that I go to. And I know jewelry does super well. I know like those wooden signs, like stuff that is not heat sensitive does well at craft shows. Stuff that you can wear year round or stuff that you can experience even in warm weather does well. Uh, yes, your local newspaper, I think is a great place to find craft shows. I never even really think about them. Um, I did a couple of farmer's markets outdoors, one in early June, one with summer items, and it was super cold and one in late September with winter items and it was super warm. Oh no. <laughs> So I found that my ideal sales window is from late October, honestly, November, because um, even late October, it's still, it can still be pretty warm. But by November, think, people are thinking about holidays and they're thinking about gifts. So late, like, late October, early November to about late February, because by the end of February, everyone's like, keeping their fingers crossed that the weather's going to break. It's probably not going to. It'll probably still be cold till like April, but they don't want to think about cold anymore. So they don't want to buy winter items anymore is what I found in my experience. Um, I saw a site I think called Festival Net, but it's $50 for a year. It tells you of all the shows in the area. Have you heard of it? I have. I have heard of Festival.net. Now the thing about them is that they don't discriminate in any way about the kind of shows that they post on their website. So with a with a show like that, I mean, with a website like that, yes, everything is posted there, but you have to do your research. Um, and you have to, in some instances, just hope that their website is actually representative of them at a show. Because I've done craft shows before where their website is garbage and I've done great at the show. And I've also done craft shows where the website is amazing and they couldn't get a person in the door at their shows. So you just have to be really careful and I think ultimately one way to kind of cover your ass and save some money is to go to the craft show first uh, I don't like bugs yet yeah, bugs are a problem <laughs>
um, look at what is being sold. Yeah, at those craft shows, you have to be really careful about that. And I'm going to talk about that some. So um, second question you ask is where is it and determine if that if wherever that is, is a good fit for you. Um, another question you ask, of course, is how much is it? Right. And there's a lot of different ways that um, craft show organizers can set up the fees that are associated with the craft show. So I'll cover just a couple of them. Um, so typically you'll have like a flat fee or a booth fee where you basically pay admittance to the show. And that is the only money that is exchanged. And honestly, I think those are the absolute best shows because once you once you start to get too creative with the way a vendor has to pay you, I think you're getting. Mm, I don't know. I think you're just too much in their pockets. Like if you can, if you're a good organizer, you can rest on the laurels of I'm going to get enough people in here so that whatever I've charged for my booth fee is going to be adequate. And I'm going to charge enough for my booth fee to cover the costs associated with this craft show. Like you as a, as an organizer need to be confident enough that you've organized the show well enough that that booth fee is going to be enough. And you should, you should be able to crunch the numbers and decide how many vendors you need at what cost um, to make sure the show is a success and get the customers in there to make sure your vendors are comfortable with your price. Um, so in addition to a booth fee, occasionally there will be a, um, a fee for you to apply, an application fee. I don't think that's a bad idea because then you only get serious vendors. So even if the application fee is like $10, $15, $20, I think it's still fair for you to make sure like I'm only getting people who are truly serious about being at this show. Now, I have seen that some organizers will actually refund your application fee um, if you're not chosen, which I think is a nice perk, but they... Most of them don't, and they honestly don't have to because you're paying to apply. You've applied. You've gotten your money's worth, right? Um, yeah, show me the money. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really about getting the, the feet in the door, the, getting the people, um, the actual customers through the door to come purchase from your vendors. That should be your main goal as an organizer, um, and you should have venues to do that. So with your application fee, I think the ideal situation is if you're accepted into the show, the application fee goes towards your booth fee. And I think most of the really good shows do that. If you're applying for a show that doesn't do that, it doesn't mean that's a bad show. I think... I think organizers come to those decisions in their own time. They learn just like we do from doing. Um, and sometimes we got to cut them a little slack if they're not doing it like the best practices way. Now, one fee structure that I will not tolerate is an income split, which basically means you can come do the show for free, but I need 20, 30% of your sales. Uh, no. No, and no, and no. First off, it's none of your business how much money I made. Second off, you're saying that the better I do, the more money you're going to make. So then I wonder, well, what is that based off of? And how are you covering your costs if you're just saying, like, I'm just going to take a percentage of your sales? I don't <clears throat> No, That's not cool. Um, I think that is, I think it's unprofessional. I honestly think it's a little sneaky. And I think it is honestly, to me, a sign of an immature craft show. Um, now, it's not uncommon to see that, but I've determined based on the way that I want to run my business that I'm not going to give somebody a percentage of my sales after I've done all the work. I'm going to pay you what it costs to be here. You let me know what it is. And that's it. That's all the money we're going to exchange. <laughs> I don't need you following up after me after my show. So I got to add up my numbers and report out to you what I made and then give you a percentage. No, let me pay you up front. And then my success is based on my success. And I get to take home every penny that I make because I made it. Okay. So for anyone who, I would love to hear from you guys on this. Have you done any shows that have split fees like this or like income splits? Or do you typically do shows that are just flat rate? Uh, I would love to know what your experience is because I'm, of course, going off my experience and what I've decided I will not tolerate within my business. Um, but if you've had a good experience with like a split the show i'd love to hear about that yeah it is a bit cheeky like it's it feels a little sneaky it feels a little get out of my pockets like <laughs> like no it does not feel good um did your hands make any of these items i don't think so exactly right and that's how i feel about it like i'm now it's no disrespect of course to organizers who decide to go this route like i said i think it's just a little immature um to think that way and a little bit greedy and sneaky and 
I don't know. It just doesn't feel good. It doesn't settle well with me. And please don't require a product from me for free to get you more money. Yeah, um, with raffles, I'm always challenged. I, I, I don't mind doing raffles because I end up with a lot of samples throughout the year. So like, for example, I might raffle off the sample of the um, Final Flurries hat that I made because that's something I had already. It was just kind of taking up space. But you shouldn't require a raffle item from your vendors. It shouldn't be required. I think it should be a donation, basically, and your raffle should go to charity. Your raffles, I don't think, should just go back to the show unless your show is a nonprofit and also does other important nonprofit -y work. Um, for me, usually flat rate and a small item donation for a raffle. Makes sense. Um, I, oh, and then, of course, there'll be like swag bag stuff and you can donate to a swag bag. Again, it should be voluntary. And I think it should be a reasonable amount. Like, if you're doing 200 swag bags, I'm not giving you 200 anything. I'm not giving you 200 pennies, much less like my smallest item is my pins, but I hand punch and make those completely on my own. And then I have to package them and put it in a business card and make it look all cute for your swag bags. No, make it a reasonable amount. One of my favorite shows, you can donate to the raffle in like certain numbers. So you can donate 20 or 50 or 100. So then they split it up between the bags and whoever gets a swag bag is whatever happens to be in that bag. Um, I've not seen a show where 20% is the rate for special cause, um, not, ju not just for the show. I've seen a show where 20% is the rate for a special cause. Do you mean like a, um, like a fundraiser? Is that what you mean? Um, I've done it before, but I refuse to do it again. I think it needs to be added to the cost for the application and the fee. Completely agreed. Yeah, and I think um, I think as we continue to grow and, and get more confident in our businesses, we can then determine what we won't do anymore, right? So the only reason I can say that I hate income split fees is because I did one and it was terrible because I already didn't make a lot of money at the show and then I felt like I was giving more money away. So it was just a bad show all around. Um, yes, once that happened to me and I realized my mistake and after that, no ma'am. All right, so, so we're on the same page here. Good, so the next question you should ask before um, applying for a craft show is, is the show juried? So for people who don't know, a, a juried craft show is basically where a selection of people work behind the scenes to review all the applications and decide who is and who isn't in the show. Now, the reason that I think it is super important for you to apply for juried shows is I think that's an additional step that um, it's an additional step that the organizers take to make sure they know who's in their show and that they're curating the, the craft show that they want to have for their customer. Now, the thing is, whenever I'm in it, whenever I apply to a juried show and I don't get in, I always feel like they made the best choice because if I'm not there, that means there were too many people just like me or the kind of product I have is not going to appeal to their customers. So either way, I think they're looking out not only for themselves, but they're looking out for me because they're saying, you're not going to do well here for whatever reason. So we're not going to have you in the show. We already have three other people who do, who are doing handmade accessories or crocheted accessories. We're not going to add you because then inevitably you guys are all competing against each other a craft show should be comfortable for everyone and yes you may have like two or three people doing the same doing a similar thing but it shouldn't be like me literally right across from somebody who's also doing hats and scarves which has also happened <laughs> literally right across the way from me and it wasn't even like they were doing baby hats and baby scarves while i was doing adult stuff like no they had a similar vibe to mine it was like the modern um like you know, 20s to 30s woman, like, was their inspiration? And, and the, the, we were the same in a lot of respects. I was literally across from myself at a craft show competing. And that's what it felt like. And, and as an organizer, that should never happen. Um, let me see, I missed something. They're trying to make Christmas Christians lie about how much they sold. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys are hilarious. Um, so definitely check to see if the show is juried. I think more often than not, if a show is juried, it's it kind of tips them over the edge of being a really good show. If you're trying to, to decide to apply to a show that is juried or not juried and basically all other things held equal, go for the juried show. I think that is the absolute best option. Um, I wrote in my notes, I said, all the best shows are juried, exclamation point, and organizers should be comfortable sharing the jury process. So, if you ask them, like, what does your jury process look like? They can say, um, 
it's all the people behind the scenes at the craft show get together and we go through them. It could be, you know, community members that review the applications. It could even be like um, past vendors that aren't vending anymore, but they should be comfortable telling you what their jury process is. It shouldn't be a secret, um, but ultimately whatever decision they make is their decision. Um, and the nice thing about a jury too is that they're really thoughtful about who goes on a wait list. So if you get into the show, great. If you go on a wait list, it's not just well, we ran out of space, so we're putting you on the wait list, or we had so many applications and we let everybody in and you were just like application number 101 and we're only taking 100. Like, that's not a thoughtful wait list. That's just how many people can we cram in this room? Don't do it. Don't do it. Next question, how many vendors? And I think that kind of relates to some of the earlier questions we were asking because you have to think about it in relation to the space that it's going to be in. So... If you are going to a craft show and there are going to be like six vendors, maybe that means that it's going to be like a small fundraiser. Maybe it's like a more intimate shopping experience for their customers or I don't know, maybe like it could potentially mean something really good or it could mean not enough people applied and we're barely going to get any traffic. So we're just trying to get just a few vendors like that's all we could get. It could go either way. Um, I think a large craft show, maybe they're having 100 or 200 or 300. I mean, like, it really depends on the show. So maybe that can mean it's a really busy show. Or it could also mean that the show is just super overcrowded. I went to a craft show once um, at a venue that I'm very familiar with. And they told me they were going to have 200 vendors. And I was like, how are you going to shove 200 vendors and thousands of customers in here? That's impossible. Everyone's going to be hot and irritable and crammed together and it's going to be terrible. Like, I just won't do that show. So again, you have to think of it in relation to the space, in relation to the time and date of the show. Is this something that could be successful? Is cramming 100 people into a space that's honestly could probably fit like 70 vendors comfortably? Is cramming 100 in there going to be successful for me? Because you're really just thinking about yourself. It's a craft show. Um, and you have to kind of make that judgment call. So she said, and their prices are low. <laughs> um, I've known shows to be good reputation. I was excited to get in. Once there, I realized it was not what I would would hear about the show. I didn't make my money back. Oh, and there were a lot of the same things. Oh, that's hard. Um, I see at every show... Then I heard it had a new coordinator uh, and they just took in whoever just to get quantity, not quality. Yeah, and that's the issue. When you when your show's not juried and you just let in everyone, hey Rose, when you just let in everyone, that doesn't end up being a quality show because I mean, what if the first 15 people who applied were jury, jewelry, 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 <laughs> jewelry. Um, then you have like, 50 jewelry vendors and nobody's going to have a particularly successful show unless you are already independently popular with whatever customers coming in there. It just makes it harder for everyone. Thank you, mom. I picked out my hair today. I fluffed it up in honor of you. Um, next question you should ask, what types of vendors are you expecting? And the reason for this is we might assume that a craft show means handmade. That's not always true though. A craft show might mean handmade and direct sales and food and charities and garage sale all in the same space, but we're calling it a craft show because there will be crafts. Um, you have to be really specific with them with what kind of vendor they're looking to let in. So you could have like, maybe it's, maybe it's called a craft show or maybe it's called like a crafts and vintage market. That's different as well because people who are coming to purchase vintage or repurpose might not be the same people who want to pay $45 for a handmade hat. Um, I have found in my personal experience that I don't do well at vintage markets because vintage could also mean low price. <laughs> it could mean I found something that was honestly just old at a flea market, spruced it up and put some, I don't know, some safety pins in it and made it look really cool. And now I have it at this vintage market. Like, you have to be really judicious about what kinds of markets you're signing up for. If it's not a venue where your customer is going to be, you should not be going there. So some terms that you might hear when it comes to craft shows, you might hear vintage, you might hear handmade, you might hear flea market or secondhand, which if you're trying to sell a handmade product is 
really not the place for you. You might also hear farmer's market and then you're going to hear something like direct sales allowed. So direct sales, again, is like Scentsy or like direct sale jewelry where people will come and purchase something typically from like a catalog um, or that person might have some of the product there, but it's not handmade. It's like mass produced. It's super cheap. And probably not a super great product, but a lot of people are interested in it because it's cheap and it gets the job done. Um, like, I, mm, I'm so mad. I went to a craft show once when I was very early on, but not super early. I think it was in my, like, second or third year. And they had a LuLaRoe lady there. And I'm like, girl, all you did was, like, cash out on a really big order and bring all these cheap-ass leggings in here while I'm over here trying to sell this $55 scarf. What are, what are we doing? We should not be at the same place. How do you feel about farmer's markets? I don't sell my product at farmer's markets. I've never found it to be successful for me. I think if it's like a holiday farmer's market, someplace that is directly trying to reach people to buy gifts, that makes sense for me. Um, but just like a random farmer's market, especially in the middle of the spring, summer, where I found a lot of the farmer's markets end up being not a good fit for me. But it might be for you. It depends on your product. Um, oh, my God, I've done a few of those craft shows. And there are maybe three handmade people, and the rest were direct sales. Terrible. We have one here in Australia called Gathered. It's just for handmade mix. That's fantastic. Yeah, a show should be very specific with what kind of product it's planning to have there and how it's curating its vendors. So definitely ask before committing to a craft show what kind of vendors they plan to have there. And that should be somewhere on their website or in their branding or marketing somewhere. Um, so, yeah. So you ask that question. Next up, what is the demographic? Basically saying what kind of customer should I expect? So let's say, for example, the show out here that I was talking about is called Craft and Outlaws. And the whole thing about it is, is it being an alternative craft market. So they take stuff with like swear words on it and like really interpretive art. And they're, they love, love, love handmade, but not necessarily like all the frilly super pretty pretty stuff like they'll take something from a vendor who's like a little rough around the edges so my product might be appropriate for them but it might not be appropriate for i don't know a craft show that aims at like young moms young soccer moms from the suburbs <laughs> like they might not be super interested in the same kind of product that's going to be at craft and outlaws so you should be able to ask the vendor like what is your show all about what kind of um, demographic are you expecting at your show like what's their age group what are their interests um, what do they expect to find at the show and again it's one of those things that helps you narrow down what kind of customer is going to be at that show to make sure it's going to be fruitful for you next question is there an entrance fee so just like the jury question an entrance fee is just like that next little thing that's going to tip them over the edge like this is a really good show because if there's an entrance fee just like when there's an application fee you're only going to get serious buyers even if i go to a craft show and the entrance fee is five dollars i'm like i'm not going to get out of bed and pay to go shop unless i'm planning to shop so if you are applying for a show that has an entrance fee that's just Another thing on top. Now, understand, if the show has an entrance fee, they probably have a higher booth fee because they're a little bit more exclusive. They're creating this atmosphere of, like, having a true shopping experience. It's not just come hang out, look at stuff, walk around, get a beer, and leave. Like, it's not that kind of show. It is, I'm here to shop. I'm here to shop. So I absolutely love the shows that have an entrance fee or if they have, like, um, an exclusive VIP night the night before or something like that. I think those shows are fantastic. So it's just another thing that puts you over the edge. Um, farmers markets work for farm sources, farm source goods, like hand-spun or farm-grown yarns. Oh, that makes a lot of sense because then you have kind of a tie-in between – um, kind of the basis for the show and whatever your product is. I think that's a really great point. Thanks, Alex. Um, we have what's called the Troy Strawberry Festival. It's pretty big, lots of different vendors. That's awesome. I think if you can find a way to <clears throat> make your product translate with the premise of the show, then you've got an in. You're good to go. <clears throat> Lastly, last question to ask before you apply for a craft show is how is this event marketed? So, if it's just flyers, um, probably not a good idea to apply to that show if literally they're resting their entire show on handing out a bunch of flyers. Now, if this is one of those like community grown, like super enmeshed, like everybody goes to these and all we have to do is put out a flyer, great. But you have to consider, I think, 
if you weren't a vendor, maybe if you were just a potential shopper, would you be targeted by their marketing tactics? Would you find out about the show? Would you be interested in the show? And if the answer is no, then maybe that's not a show that you pursue. Um, so I always encourage people to look at the multiple streams of ways that people, that craft shows will market themselves. Do they have an email list? Are they sending it out via social media? Are they connecting with community organizations and putting out flyers? Are there vendors? Are their own vendors helping with the marketing? So if you know somebody who's in the show and they don't ever mention it, you're like, they don't even care. They don't even care enough to let people know they're going to be at the show. So why would I even bother? So those are just nine questions to ask before you commit to a craft show. I want to leave some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to go quickly through four tips to keep your craft show application out of the reject pile. Okay. I'm going to jump right into these. We're, we're switching gears that fast. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Tip number one to keep your craft show application out of the reject pile is to follow the rules and read the fine print. Um, as someone who has been on a committee for a craft show before, <clears throat> the fastest way that you will get me to not look at your application again is if I ask you to post photos to your application and you direct me to your Facebook page. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do that because you are one of literally hundreds of people who have applied and all those other people follow the rules. So I'm just going to go look at their applications because they did what I asked them to do. So don't like don't not do the application properly <laughs> like do the application properly or you're going to end up in the reject pile um don't apply with a product that you know is not going to be appropriate for that show and that kind of falls into the rules and fine print so if they say this show is handmade and you don't make a handmade product don't apply or if they say this show is for um if this is a if this is a farmer's market and they exclusively want like food goods don't apply if you do handmade. Like, it's not the appropriate place for you. And that application is going to go in the trash, rightfully so. Because one, you're not going to make any money at that show. And two, the organizers are just going to, like, randomly put you in a space that, like, there's no context of you being there. Everybody's selling strawberry jam, and you're out here with pom-pom hats. They don't, they don't have nothing to do with each other. I can like strawberry jam and not pom-pom hats. But maybe if I saw you in a different context that made a lot more sense for your handmade product, maybe I'd buy it from you. So they're trying to create an atmosphere for their, for their customers, and you're basically inserting yourself and saying, well, it's a crap show, so I want to be in it. It's not important for you. <laughs> um, did you or will you go over how to prepare for a market, making items, how much to bring? Yes, I'm going to be going over that next week. Um, what's the difference between a festival and a craft show? So... <sighs> So there's a lot of words that a craft show could be called, right? So it could be a craft show, it could be a market, it could be a bazaar, it could be a festival, it could be a whatever. Typically, when I hear festival, I think music, food, beer, like there's a lot of other activities going on. There might be a craft show component, which isn't a bad idea. There's a show out here called, there's a festival out here called the Community Festival, and it's all those things. It's live music, it's beer, it's like games, it's out in a really nice park and it's just people milling about and enjoying themselves and some of them will stop over to the craft show but it's not primarily a craft show so when you're thinking about festivals you have to consider too like what else is going on at this festival and is it going to ultimately detract from people um, coming to see my product so it's a decision that you have to make um, I've been getting invites to be a vendor via Etsy um, coordinators are looking for local makers on Etsy is that something new no that's not new it's not new. Um, so since you can search on Etsy by region and you can like really, really narrow it down, you're easy to find. If you filled out all the information about your shop on Etsy, you're easy to find. So no, it's definitely not new for, um, for market organizers to find vendors via Etsy. It's happened to me before. Sometimes it shows good, sometimes it's not. Typically the first time they reach out, I'll say um, no thank you or I'll, I'll say no thank you and say like, but I look forward to, um, you know, coming to shop. And if I decide after I shop it that it's a really good show, then I'll try and apply the next year or the next month or whatever. Um, we have had Etsy markets here in Australia. That's awesome. Um, so 
first tip to keep your application out of the reject pile is follow the direction and read the fine print. Second off, share your absolute best photos. So let's say, for example, you don't have a really strong online presence, but you have an amazing product um, and, they, and you're applying for this show and you really want them to take you regardless of the fact that you can't direct them to Facebook or Instagram or your Etsy shop or whatever. If you have good photos, you don't necessarily have to have a really big online presence. I, I I think you should have an online presence, um, and I'm going to talk about that next, but in case you don't, you're really resting on your photos, so you should take the absolute best photos that you possibly can. I am not above hiring someone to take your product photography. I've done it many a times, still do. I have a fabulous photographer that I like to work with, um, so if you are not great at taking the pictures yourself, which I'm hard-pressed to think that you're not, I think you could take a good picture, because it ends up being a lot about like staging and editing and just making sure it's a clear photo um there are a lot of resources available online on how to take your own product photography so hire someone do it yourself but either way make sure it's your absolute best so i saw an example online when i was looking up these resources today and it was a coffee mug same coffee mug on the left on the left left on the left was the coffee mug that was on like a marble countertop and it was like super dark and there was like a lot of just stuff in the background that was super distracting and then on the right was the same coffee mug and it looked like they put it in a light box it was like a nice flat white background really well lit so it's the same product but even as a craft show organizer i want to be able to look at it and say is this something i would buy is this something i'd be attracted to now granted that product's going to look different when it's on your craft show table but this is your first opportunity to make that really good first impression to say yes my product is worthy of being in your craft show look how amazing that it looks right um so take your absolute best photos Number three, best way to keep your application out of the reject pile is to have an online presence. I think it's super duper important. Even if it's not social media, you should have some kind of web store or website where your product is featured. Even if you're not ultimately selling it and you just like maybe have a few blog posts, um, but somewhere where people can get more context about your business and your product outside of your application. Because um, there are some organizers, myself included, who take the extra step to say, okay, you filled out this application looks great let me take a look at your brand let me take a further deeper look into your products and get a better idea of how you sell yourself and like what what you're all about um, so you can develop that by having a really basic website or even just having an Etsy page um, that's really well set up but having an online presence is super important we're just in that dig digital age now where you can't really just be a shop in the house, <laughs> not connected to anybody else with no means of anybody connecting with you because you're not on the World Wide Web somewhere. So work on your online presence at least enough so people can get an impression, a positive impression of you and your product if they're judging you for a craft show. And then lastly, um, last tip to keep your application out of the reject pile is to offer something different, right? So... Um, see, I know quite a few shows that when you apply immediately, ask for your social media and check out in addition to your website. Super true. And they do. And I think um, a lot of the organizers now look at social media as an opportunity for their marketing. So if you're not on Instagram or you're not on Facebook, they're wondering how are you going to help um, get the word out about the show, even if you do get in? And like, should they be investing in you basically to get people in the door because a lot of craft shows have that obligation for their vendors. You have to help get the word out too. And if you're not on social media, you don't have a website, you don't have a presence to kind of speak as loudly as they might want you to, you might not get in. Oh. So offer something different, right? So you can do that in a lot of different ways. So maybe you and I both offer hats and scarves, but I'm different in that I have like, a, I've really invested in my display um, or I really invested in my photography, or I have um, a very unique uh, look and feel to my product. Maybe I, I have like a very well-defined product line with colors and textures and, and, 
and options that you don't have. So find a way to stand out from your competition. Don't look at the person next to you and say, well, we both sell hats. Be like, how do you sell hats differently? How do you set yourself apart from that next person? Because that may be the deciding factor between you and the other person who sell hats getting into the show. Maybe they have three spots for people who sell hats and you're trying to muscle out somebody else. Um, so you got to focus on what sets you apart and really sell yourself in that application. Um, and you can do that through your photography and of course um, also through you know whatever branding you have online and through your actual application. Of course. Um, I purchased your adorned shawl pattern. I can't wait to work. Oh, that's exciting. Thanks, babe. I appreciate that. So that is all that I have for tonight. I think we have like 10 minutes left. So I want to open up the floor for questions or for any kind of feedback that you guys have. If anything that I said was super off base, I totally want to talk about it. If you agree with it, let me know, throw out some hearts. Um, but I, I, I want to get to a place where I'm offering a little bit more opportunity for us to kind of chit chat at the end of these lives. Because Y'all already know, I can talk all night. And I've literally had times where I've gotten cut off by Instagram because I was talking too much. Um, so if you guys have questions about craft shows, if you have questions about anything that I mentioned, definitely throw them up there. Um, I'm watching while working on my flat iron show. Oh my gosh, so excited. So one of the, Kate, your, your shawl is working up so nice. And I think like through your like stories and how you're kind of taking us through that process with you. I'm just so excited to see how it turns out. Have you decided if you're putting the um, the speckled yarn in the middle or at the end? Let me know. Um, how much did you invest in your first craft show? So that very first craft show, I paid $10. And aside from my actual craft show fee, I, I only invested in my product, which was a mistake. Um, you do have to invest in your display because my product ended up being mostly flat. And I mean, you think about hats and scarves, if you just stack them up on a table, like that's not very appealing. You know, that just feels like, well, I can just go to Old Navy and buy a hat and a scarf if that's all it is. Like I should have focused on the um, merchandising of my product the way that like a retail store does. So like focusing on height and um, enticing people to touch things and try things on and putting things on mannequins and stuff like that. So. I didn't invest much in my very first show. It took time for me to understand that you do have to invest in more than just your product for your craft shows. Um, working on swag while listening. What show are you doing, Nicole? Um, how do you add the bit.ly to Instagram? Is there instructions somewhere? So you can just go to bit.ly. And um, so bit.ly is just a shortened link, right? So you can go to bit.ly, put the longer link in, and then you can go to your profile, edit your profile, and put that into the URL space. Of course, we all know you get one URL on Instagram, and that is in your profile. Crafty Supermarket. Ooh, exciting. <laughs> love it. Um, I'm working on the variegated now, actually, and decided it's in the middle. Nice choice. I love that. So the shawl that I did as a sample, the shawl that I did as a sample for local yarn store day, that was the one with, like, the... Um, it was like a teal in the middle and then like two speckles on the outside. Like I liked the idea of like, there were really hard fades. Like the stripes were very well defined. The stripes between colors were super defined and I really liked that. So I love that you're putting the speckled in the middle cause then you'll have like those hard transitions and then you have the solids on the outside. Fantastic idea. Absolutely love it. Making fabric washing tape, washi tape. How do you do that? How do you make fabric sticky just on one side? um yeah that's exciting um so okay we're probably gonna wrap up because it looks like everything i said was amazing and you guys got a really great time out of it um as far as things that i want to let you know if you're interested in the shirt maker of things this shirt is available in my shop um for anyone who's new i do offer things other than patterns i have pins i have um carpet tape i never thought about that that's genius it's so smart I have pins, I have mugs, and I now have t-shirts. So I have a making of, maker of things shirt, I have a work in progress shirt, and then I have one that's really funny that has to do with counting, or that um, has to do with, I'm not actually listening, I'm thinking about yarn. That, that one's my favorite one. I got a stain on it, so I can't like wear it on Instagram anymore. It stains like right here. 
because I don't know where my mouth is when I eat. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me tonight. Go pick up the Flatiron Shawl. One of the Kate, I think, is a really good um, person to follow if you're interested in that pattern and just want to see how they're working up. You can also follow the hashtag Flatiron Shawl. There's one for the Serenity Shawl. There's hashtags for basically all of my patterns. So you can go check them out if you wanted to see other people's versions of them. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. Like I said, I have found a way to pull these lives off and put them on YouTube. So anyone who caught it late or um, is on the replay and there's something that you missed, um, you will be able to find these on my YouTube channel very, very soon. The one from last week is going up tonight and this one fingers crossed, we'll go up tomorrow. Um, so definitely, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, leave me a comment below. Let me know your horror stories when it comes to craft shows or anything that you've really learned over time. That's what we'd love to know. Um, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. And um, I've had a great night and I will see you next time.